My name is Dr. Lane Green. I'm a, a neurologist and headache specialist. I'm based out of uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia at Dalhousie University, which is a, a teaching, uh, teaching hospital with a medical school there. Um, I did my headache medicine subspecialty training at the Mayo Clinic um, in Arizona. One of the ways that I like to conceptualize migraine is to, to think about migraine as a, as a, well again, a chronic neurological disease, but it has, it has a threshold um, to it. And when patients or individuals that have migraine are below that threshold, then they're not having uh, individual migraine attacks. And when they're above that threshold, uh, then that's when the migraine becomes more, more symptomatic uh, to them. So when uh, trying to identify uh, contributing factors, uh, I tend to break them down into two main categories. One of those categories is daily life routine category. And then the other side is a more medically based or medical uh, comorbidities, um, shall we say. For the daily life routine things, it's, it's important to to analyze um, an individual um, for certain aspects. And again, these are not going to be in any particular order of, of, of importance. Um, but one of the things um, I look at is uh, a sleep, sleep routines. Um, and does someone have a regular sleep or irregular sleep? And how does that vary day to day, uh, work day to weekend um, to vacation? Because uh, that can give us some important, uh, important information. Along with that is how does exercise um, fit in? Because we know that regular exercise is important um, and it, is their exercise routine um, uh, regular. Also, um, also on that, diet um, fits in um, quite heavily. And more important, is there a well-balanced um, diet? Um, and are people avoiding um, skipping meals? Because that skipping meal aspect can be quite detrimental um, to migraine. Along with the diet uh, comes dehydration. Uh, so it's important that people are staying adequately hydrated uh, with water um, and avoiding, uh, avoiding caffeine. And getting into caffeine, uh, assessing total caffeine content uh, is important. Knowing um, how much caffeine an individual is taking in an individual day and does that vary from uh, day to day, work day to, to weekend for, um, for example fluctuations in caffeine can be a contributing um, issue as, as well. Also, people can have individual triggers for their migraine and they can uh, have sometimes easily identified those. And it's important to know if patients are taking appropriate steps uh, to avoid the triggers um, that they know uh, can, I'm sorry, the triggers that they have identified, are they taking appropriate steps uh, to avoid those? Um, and then the last, last one is part of the daily routine is I think of, of stress. Uh, so everyone has stress. It's important uh, to know about that. We can never eliminate all stress, but it's more important to know how uh, an individual is managing that stress and dealing with that stress in their everyday life. And it's that stress management side of things that is, uh, that is more important than uh, actually having the stress um, or not. Then, so then I move more into the, the medical side of things in terms of things that can be um, medically uh, contributing to things that are going on. Um, one of the big medical things we look at is the frequency of acute medication use. Uh, so this can be a very big contributing medical factor for, for migraine. So overuse of acute medications can be a significant, a significant issue. And then other medical issues that, that a patient has, and in particular there's a couple we, we look for. If someone has another pain um, disorder um, other than their migraine, its treatment can be significantly influential uh, for managing, uh, managing their migraine. We do look at psychiatric uh, conditions, so mood disorders, anxiety disorders, other things along those lines. Uh, again, not important not to neglect that side of uh, someone's health as well. We do also need to look for history of abuse. It does uh, correlate highly with chronic, uh, chronic headache disorders, so it's important to identify that if it's, um, if it's at play in someone's current state. So uh, one of the other medical conditions that may not be as uh, on the forefront of everyone's mind is, uh, is obstructive sleep apnea. And this can be a, a significant um, 
uh, factor for migraines. In its own right, it can be a, a trigger, but it also can be multifactorial because it does um, contribute to poor uh, sleep uh, routines with people. So again, one thing that I'm very suspicious of: ask people about uh, and screen them for this um, screen them for this condition. Um, other things that people may not know about. Um, because sometimes it happens in sleep, so they can have uh, troubles with grinding or clenching um, their teeth um, at night. So sometimes it's important to talk to their dentist to see if there are these signs um, on their teeth, and so addressing that can be helpful. If that goes a bit too far, sometimes people can actually have troubles with their, their jaw joint, so a temporal mandibular joint um, disorder, again, could also be another uh, consequence of that that could have negative effects for their, um, for their migraine. And then the last one that, uh, that I tend to look for is that some of the nerves that uh, supply uh, sensation to the, mostly to the scalp area on the brain, some of these nerves can become quite hypersensitive over time, especially with more chronic and more frequent um, migraines. And it's important to uh, identify these if they're present because it can offer part uh, some treatment options um, going forward for the for the patient. So depending on the nerves, so the most common one that p patients may have may heard of is something called occipital um, neuritis. I don't tend to call it neuritis, um, um, or sorry, neuralgia, but it's more of a neuritis, more of a, an irritated, hypersensitive um, nerve. Sometimes nerve block um, procedures. Uh, can be helpful um, in addressing things going going forward. But similarly, there's nerves on the on the side of the head, uh, which is called the auricular temporal nerve, and one on the front, which is the supraorbital nerve. And all of those nerves can become hypersensitive if uh, a migraine disorder is uh, is quite frequent. Um, and again, important to identify that as a potential um, contributing um, contributing factor. Again, these contributing factors aren't the the causes of migraine because the the cause is this underlying genetic uh, predisposition to be closer to this threshold, but these, these factors um, can keep people closer to the threshold, and, uh, but also it can uh, push them over the, I guess, push them over the edge uh, a little bit more frequently as well. They can vary patient, um, patient to patient. Um, some patients are a little bit more educated about um, contributing factors um, than others. The ones that we have discussed are, are, are fairly common ones and are common themes patient to patient. Of course, not every patient is going to have all of those. Um, they, may have a, they may have a subset um, of those. Um, and the other part too is that sometimes it is difficult to know how much those individual factors are uh, what the weight of those in terms of how negatively that is affecting their um, their migraine disorder. So that can also vary um, from from patient um, from patient to patient. Again, the ones that we've discussed, I don't think have a a preference for for gender or a particular particular sex. Um, so I think they are on, unfortunately equal equal opportunity. Um, amongst um, amongst gender, um, I guess the the one the one exception uh, maybe which we didn't specifically talk about um, before uh, would be a, a hormonal um, relationship um, for migraine. Um, so uh, women are three times more likely than men to have have migraine. A lot of that is largely uh, largely based on hormonal um, relationships. Um, and one of the things that we do do know and what we believe is is that fluctuations, particularly in, in estrogen, may be responsible um, for this. Um, and estrogen uh, fluctuates throughout a, a woman's menstrual cycle. Typically, just before the cycle begins, the estrogen is, is decreasing. I mean, it may be that decrease in estrogen um, that may be a trigger or a contributing factor that is raising or bringing a, a woman closer to the, the threshold um, for migraine. Again, not the cause, but again, one of these contributing, uh, one of these contributing issues. So, um, yes, when we're I guess in medical school and, and residency and early on, say in fellowship, we're you know, primarily interested in the, the drug treatments and what drugs should be used for acute treatments of migraine uh, and the preventative treatments of migraine. But as, as 
that evolves and as you gain more understanding into to migraine as a, a chronic neurological disorder, we know that the, the comprehensive management and treatment plan for migraine is not only the, uh, the drug treatments that we have available to us, but you have to consider all of the, all of the treatments. So a lot of them will be non-drug treatments, so some of these lifestyle um, modifications. Also looking at all of these contributing factors and, and taking those into account as the overall uh, comprehensive management plan um, for the patient going forward. We're looking, uh, as, as we don't have a, a cure yet um, for migraine, um, being able to have our, our largest chances of success to, to decrease migraine frequency, to decrease the severity, to decrease the duration and the resultant uh, disability um, that migraine uh, gives to individual patients this, these comprehensive plans addressing all of these issues are, are important to give us our best chance of success um, in making people um, better going forward.